Hello then, folks. Uh, here we go, one o'clock on the dot. QED runs on time. That's, a, that's an autistic superpower for you. Um, so, um, thank you very much for coming to everybody. It's nice to see a very, very full room. Um, we'll endeavour to have something, something entertaining and interesting to say to you all today. Um, so, my name's Mike. Um, I'm, uh, I'm autistic. I was diagnosed a couple of years ago. Um, it was a big surprise to me. Apparently not a surprise to anybody else that I know. <laughs> Which is, all right, non-taken. Um, but, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be the chair for the panel today. Um, and, but uh, I will let the remainder of the panel introduce themselves, starting at the end there. Hello, I'm Alice. Um, I am also autistic. Uh, diagnosed also fairly recently in adulthood. Um, yeah, I don't, don't think I've got much more else to say. Um, hi, I'm Lana. Uh, you might remember me from such panels as Parenting this morning. Um, <laughs> so I was diagnosed with ADHD um, a few years ago. I also have a son who is autistic. Uh, I'm Lindsay, and uh, yeah, I was just a couple of months ago officially diagnosed with ADHD. So that was pretty fun. It's good. It's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> made sense out of a lot of things. Yeah. Um, so uh, we'll start off with the first question, which is typically where you start. Um, unless you're a computer programmer, then you start at question zero. But um, we'll start off with the first question. Um, so in 2019, um, Greta Thunberg said, I have Asperger's, uh, and that means I'm sometimes a bit different from the norm. And given the right circumstances, being different is a superpower. Uh, was she right? Alice. That is that key bit there, given the right circumstances. I think with that caveat, yes, I think neurodivergent, being neurodivergent can give you lots and lots of benefits. Without that caveat, there's a, you know, there's a whole lot of shit that we deal with when you're trying to live in a society that is not set up for, for neurodivergent people, that is more tailored to neurotypical people. So in those cases, you know, we're all burnt out all the time. We're all exhausted. We're all struggling to, to fit into this system that's not built for us. It very much feels like not a superpower in those times. It's, um, it's uh, touching on that, given the right circumstances, that's not just like given the happenstances of your life. So, for example, my, my son is autistic and uh, he was initially in a school where before he was diagnosed and he would have meltdowns every day at school because he would be overwhelmed by the other children. He'd be overwhelmed by the tasks that were given him. Um, he would struggle to communicate those needs. And every time he'd have a meltdown, he'd go and sit on the naughty table in the corner and not have to not be able to do any of his work. Um, and eventually we happened to move house and happened to move schools at the new at the same time. And the new school had a um, inclusivity officer who was, clued up on neurodivergency and uh, was the one that pushed to get him his diagnosis. And he went from uh, being the naughty child stuck on the naughty table all by himself all day, every day with no friends and not actually achieving anything in school to being, uh, they set him up his own um, uh, accessibility things that he needed. So he needed ear defenders. He needed a quiet space that he could go to when he was overwhelmed so that it wouldn't re it wouldn't escalate to a meltdown. And suddenly he went from being unable to engage with his peers and unable to um, like engage in school. And now he's succeeding in mainline school. Um, he's now in the scholars program because he excels in certain areas like maths and computing because those are his special interests. And it's not just these are the circumstances I fall into. It's what are the, the circumstances that can be created that, that allow those people to succeed, right? And, and just to be clear on that, a, a, a meltdown, which people might not be necessarily familiar with the terminology, is where a, an autistic person um, has a, a very um, extreme emotional reaction to an overwhelming stimulus. And it's not a pleasant thing, um, but in a child, it looks an awful lot like a temper tantrum. 
it looks like you're just you know screaming and shouting and stamping your feet and it's not a, ten to t- a temper tantrum um it's that's not what it is at all and i still get meltdowns now where i just absolutely collapse into an into a wreck more commonly i get what they uh, refer to as the the rumble stages where you can feel a meltdown is there you can feel i'm on the cusp of just going over the edge here and this is not going to be pleasant especially in a workplace right when you don't want to go over that and you know meltdown all over your colleagues that's not that's not a nice <laughs> thing to do um but uh, yeah, in, in children especially, it does just resemble a tantrum. And before we had um, uh, autism recognised as a as a diagnosis, a lot of autistic children would have just been problem kids. You know, the the problem like problem child in Problem Child, the the film Problem Child, almost certainly autistic and or ADHD um, with, in the way that that character is portrayed. Uh, yeah, no, I will echo everything that's been said here. I think that this question is a trap. I mean, we have to contradict Greta. <laughs> this question. That's, that's not very nice of you. Um, it's a yeah, terrible so. thing to do. So, how old is she now? Is she an adult? Are we allowed to contradict her now? Yeah, we probably are. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Yeah. That question is very different from a woman than the, than the newspapers are often <laughs> about young women oh, yeah. coming of age. Um, yeah, so I, I generally agree that like with the caveats that we're talking about under the right circumstances, given the right support, uh, given understanding in the right environment, that there are some things can be super valuable about difference in general. I mean, difference sort of more broadly, even mm-hmm. the neurodivergence is super valuable because we we all had the exact same perspective and the exact same skills and strengths. We'd all be sort of replaceable to each other. That would suck. Uh, that's um, a really interesting point, actually, because we like we do talk about diversity, inclusion and representation in broad spheres, but I don't think we talk enough about it in neurodivergence. Yeah, yeah. So I think that there is real value in that. But uh, but yeah, the cha- challenge as well. So yeah. Yeah. And there's there's some things that we can, you know, uh, uh, being neurodiv- neurodivergent makes uh, life an awful lot easier for us. So Lana, I know, for example, you worked in um, waitressing for a long time, mm-hmm. which in that environment you excelled because of the because of the way your adhd worked also the qed boards do abuse me every year because <laughs> i i come, valuable skills I, I come here with my adhd and you give me a hundred desperate dopamine filled problems <laughs> for a whole weekend and i will work myself till i fall on one day <laughs> and love every second of it um so that it is a superpower but it's very easy to also like take that too far, right? But also th- things like our, our little QED booklets here. These these are a product of my autistic brain, um, where <laughs> I'm, gl- I'm glad you like them. Typos included, <laughs> With, in, including the typos. They're a product of my burnt out autistic brain. <laughs> Uh, but things like, you know, we hang it so that it, you know, your name hangs in the right direction. We print the contents upside. Confuses the printers every year. Every year they're like, you messed this up here, love. Um, every year they get this wrong. But printed the content upside down. So, and that's just something that, you know, that I would have done. That I don't know if I would have done the same thing if I'd have been neurotypical. I might have done, I don't know. Because um, I've never been neurotypical, so that makes it tricky to know, right? Um, so th- th- there are things where you look at problems from a from a different angle, and there's, there's cases where people will be sitting around and will be problem solving, and the pro- the solution will just seem so obvious to me and so straightforward, and just well, obviously you just do that, mm. um, and no one else seems to be able to see it in the world just because you you're coming at a problem from that from that peculiar angle. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, um, do do you think that the the popular belief that autistic people are geniuses and savants, does that, is that harmful to autistic people? Well, then this is the thing that I find really interesting because I think if, if we were to survey the room and ask, does Mike come across as the genius savant type or do I come across as the genius savant type, yeah. it's going to be a very different <laughs> thing to, for, for, for our different presentations because we obviously present very, very differently. But also... Um, that's often very that male presentation of autism so yes there are some autistic men who have that special interest that looks like you're a genius or a savant yeah which might just be you you've really studied this one thing that is your special interest rather than actual genius um and then people make the assumption that that's what it is so when i was diagnosed with autism when i was thinking about it so i was on the um waiting list with the NHS for three years, um, which is a very long wait. And in the meantime, I'm 
autism became my special interest. I was reading all about autism and learning all about it and, and con convincing myself and eventually self-diagnosing that I, you know, I was utterly convinced that this is, this, is, this is who I am, this is a big part of me. And I kind of tested the waters with people in my close circle of this is, you know, I, I think I might be autistic. And the, the most common response I got was, what, you? No, not possibly. You're not, you're not one of those weirdo <laughs> genius types. You couldn't possibly be autistic. You, you present in, you know, you're too personable and friendly and, and we don't expect that from autism. So this, these stereotypes mean that people don't get diagnosed. People who present in a different way, just they don't feel that, like that diagnosis belongs to them because they don't fit with the, with the ideal. And that's what was really interesting about that is you might notice that uh, I'm, I'm the only um, I'm man on this panel. Um, that wasn't deliberate. I asked at least eight autistic men to come and appear on this panel, and I could not get anybody who was willing to come and appear on the panel for it. Um, autistic women, falling over myself with people who were like, yeah, <laughs> love to, brilliant, fantastic. Because um, we're often socialised to be much more... You kind of... There's this thing with autistic women that often you're, you learn how to mask much more easily than, than men... Because we're socialised to do it and we're taught that we have to be pleasing for, for everybody and we have to find a way to fit in and not be the, the weird child. And it, men are, and boys are given more permission to be a bit weird. And it's, obviously, it's still really hard for, for men and boys with <laughs> autism, but it's that difference in how we socialise kids that means we grow up to women mask well, well and, and me being the weirdo doctor who fan that was just mike's the weirdo doctor who fan that's fine that's just expected that's boys, just boys like sci-fi that's, that's where it's okay yeah that's just an ordinary thing um what about what about in adhd so the portrayal of adhd in popular culture is less obvious than it is with autism with autism you got obviously you've got films like rain man but then you've also got autistic coded characters like you've got house spock bones. data house um nice. Seven of Nine is, is a, a, a really great example of an autistic coded character. Um, and yeah, in Buffy, I'm convinced is autistic. Um, <laughs> but uh, ADHD characters in fiction, um, in terms of people diagnosed, one notable exception I can think of is Bart Simpson. So Bart Simpson is diagnosed ADHD in one episode, never mentioned again, <laughs> never comes up again. Um, but then also like Tony Stark, uh, you know, portray some very obvious ADHD traits. Um, Elliot Page's character in Juno, I've never seen Juno, so I can't say anything more about it, but, you know, a lot of people say, oh, that's clearly a portrayal of an ADHD person, even if that's not, that's not deli done deliberately. Um, do we think ADHD is underrepresented in popular culture? Lindsay? Um, women, ADHD, there was the whole manic fixie dream girl mm -hmm. mean thing, and I think that kind of fits. Yeah. Yeah, too. Like, people like Zoe Beck, Deschanel, that's a good point. Um, yeah, no, I really struggled to come up with characters beyond the ones that you listed here that at least that was explicit. And even if you're thinking about like coding for those kinds of traits, mm. it's, it's pretty hard to come up with examples. But is it just me? I had a Google. I, yeah. I had a Google, of course I did. Read the notes, had a Google um, my whole life. You've got, so there are, there are two presentations of ADHD. Um, there, there is the hyperactive presentation and there is the um, inattentive presentation and then there is a, and those are the diagnostic criteria and then there is a third presentation which is a mixture of the both um, so you might be hyperactive in some areas and inattentive in others or you might just be like me and have the whole thing across the whole board just lots of um, chaos just 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 <laughs> chaos um, and the representation that we see a lot is the hyperactive um, presentation either in the manic pixie dream girl thing or uh, Bart Simpson's um, very much fits within that stereotype of the hyperactive little boy, which is what is typically the most diagnosed presentation of ADHD because it's the most disruptive within a within a class school setting. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, the inattentive presentation of ADHD tends to be um, mm. more predominant, from what I understand, um, just from reading up on stuff in. Um, girls, whether that's because that's the way our brains work or whether that's the way uh, we're socialized or, or whatever. Uh, maybe the only um, representation in that fiction would be like Luna Lovegood from the Harry Potter oh. series. It's got that kind of absent, dreamy, um, uh, daydreamy thing. Uh, is, is maybe that only trope that you see, but is never 
explored really uh, so we, we are aware of it culturally we're aware of that that little girl who's got a head in a book that um is is daydreaming all the time um but we don't really think of that as a problem because it's not disruptive mm. uh, um i've got this theory that mike and alice may have heard like three or four million times that um <laughs> <laughs> uh neurodivergency is is often under uh underdiagnosed where it doesn't interfere with capitalism yeah, yeah. if if you <laughs> if you can Absolutely. if you can work if you can go to school if you can be educated mm -hmm. if you pass under that radar it doesn't really matter how difficult those struggles are day to day until they get to a threshold where it's like oh this person can't function anymore in inside of capitalism mm -hmm. um, and i think that's where we we miss those um absent uh, inattentive presentations of ADHD. I think that's why I got diagnosed so late. Like, yeah. I, I did fine in school because, uh, you know, oh, we didn't talk about hyper focus. Give you like, a deadline. You know, <laughs> the, the, the double edged uh, superpower there. But uh, uh, I found lectures so engrossing that, like, I just paid so much attention in class. <laughs> didn't matter that I couldn't study. So I got through all that and then I got a job. Yeah, that was, that was not good. So. And it's fine until it's not fine. Exactly. Yeah. Which is where it goes back to your, your, your term of autistic, uh, of autistic burnout or hmm. ADHD burnout, right? I had one other thought about the media representations piece or cultural representations is that like when I do see ADHD come up in like television shows and stuff um, explicitly, it's often a joke about overdiagnosis or drug seeking behavior. Hmm. Yes. Um, and that, yeah, I've like been thinking a lot lately about like the problems with that being the primary association Socially, it's been ADHD a big diagnosis. part of the conversation, hasn't it? Yeah, that yeah. Particularly pr young problem boys mm -hmm. who are just kicking up fuss in class. Oh, they just, you know, we're just trying to excuse our bad parenting rather than that. Yeah. Or that, I, I don't know, I, I, I figured out a couple of years ago that this was probably a thing that fit with my experiences, but I resisted going to actually get a diagnosis for a long time because I thought I was just going to be looked at as a drug seeker. Um, and, the, you know. That would be questioned, which often happens with women, by the way, in terms of the diagnosis of ADHD. Uh, it's more underdiagnosed in women because of the disruptiveness presentation stuff that you talked about. Um, and often misdiagnosed as things like an anxiety disorder or depression, which often can be secondary to the actual ADHD symptoms. So that's fun. Yeah. yeah well, after I was um, diagnosed autistic and I went to my GP and said, hey, what can you do for me? What's, you know, what's, what's the deal? What can I get in terms of support services for this? Um, and they referred me to the General Mental Health um, Service for Liverpool. Um, and they then uh, set up a session for me to have a session with a counsellor. 20 minutes into the first session, they say, you know, we don't do autism, right? That's not what we... I could treat you for generalised anxiety disorder, but we can't treat you for autism. So that's great. I don't have generalised anxiety disorder. <laughs> so I think I'll take a pass on that. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. um, just returning to the topic of, of, of Bart Simpson and what you were saying about kind of the, the drug-seeking behavior, what I thought was interesting in that episode of The Simpsons, I don't know if people are familiar with that episode of The Simpsons where Bart's diagnosed with ADHD. Um, Marge Simpson is particularly down on the idea of Bart being medicated for it. Um, she's talking about, you know, this is untested, experimental medication. Marge often in The Simpsons is the voice of reason. Um, Marge and Lisa especially. Lisa, definitely autistic. Um, <laughs> But Marge and Lisa are often very much the voice of reason in, uh, in, in The Simpsons. Um, and Marge was so down on, on Bart taking it. And then initially when Bart was medicated, he became a well-behaved student. He excelled in his studies. And then he slowly became more paranoid, started living in a bin, stopped washing. And it, kind of, all these side effects came on. Came up with this paranoid conspiracy theory. Spoilers for The Simpsons. Um, <laughs> he came up with these paranoid conspiracy theories about how Major League Baseball were manipulating the town, which it turned out he was right. <laughs> which was the, twi the twist ending, right? Is that actually Major League Baseball were manipulating the system, etc., etc., etc. But he, the, 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 they were so down on the idea of Bart being medicated. And then by the end of the episode, as I say, never mentioned again. You never see Bart taking his Ritalin, or focusing, as they called it in the, in the show. They never, you never saw Bart taking his Ritalin for the rest of the series. Mm. They just went straight back to the, the way things had been before. Mm. Um, do we think there is such a thing as neurodiversity without trauma? No. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, it, de- I, like, it depends on so many things, right? But for, for the vast majority of people I've spoken to and, and my own experiences, when you're growing up in a world that's not built for you, it affects you every in ways you can't begin to imagine or, or understand. You get this diagnosis and you're like, okay, now I have to unpack everything that I've ever experienced and see how did this affect me? Was this autism? Was this just me? And really analyze it from every angle. And you realize, yeah, I mean, you know, maybe if, I, if people were aware of this when I was a child and were given the tools to help support me, then I might have been slightly more well-adjusted as an adult. But you can't possibly know. It's very stressful for an autistic brain to think, I can't possibly know how these things have affected me, but I know that I live with a lot of difficulties through nobody's fault, right? If, if you're not diagnosed and, you know, I'm, I have particular issues with how my parents have, have interacted with me because also, you know, autism runs in families, so almost certainly undiagnosed autism um, in my family as well. That, like, you know, I've kind of always been told, well, you were just not, you know, you're a very emotional child and you didn't want hugs and things. It's like, maybe if you talk to me about emotions, I might have learned to recognise them a little better and, and uh, maybe things would be a bit different. But no one knows to do that if you're not diagnosed. Lana? I don't know. Maybe, I hope there will be one day. I think we're seeing, so there's, uh, we're seeing a, we're seeing more people diagnosed. We're seeing more people diagnosed. Now that the... the Vaccines diagno- are kicking in. It's, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Quadruple vaxxed. Um, so uh, now, that, uh, now that the diagnostic criteria has obviously been um, broadened um, for, uh, for, for uh, autism, autism specifically... Um, we're seeing more people diagnosed and we're seeing more pressure put on schools where a lot of the trauma happens. Um, is there a chance that we might start to break that? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure I have much trauma specifically around my ADHD. There were things in my life I've found more difficult than necessary, but that, that thing you talk about where your family is wild because my... Mm. Some someday I'll have to come on Swack and we'll tell all the wild stories about my mother. <laughs> um, maybe just Mike can tell them because he'll do them better than me. Um, but uh, so she is a vaccine denying Reiki instructor. Um, she she's like full that way, um, which is one of the reasons that even though my brother was diagnosed with ADHD and I was flagged from a young age. Um, we were never treated for them, apart from a strict ban on E numbers in my house. Because um, that will make you more hyper. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because it, it wasn't. It blue wasn't, Smarties, right? You're not allowed Blue Smarties. Yeah, what's the ADHD? It's the Skittles. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I talked to her about my struggles with ADHD recently. She's like, those are normal things. <laughs> Everyone has that. No, me and you have that mark, right? <laughs> Both of us, not everyone. Um, so that the way that generational trauma gets passed down, and maybe yeah. our like our generation where we're, we're all stepping up and owning up and taking that, doing the work to get diagnosed and get the treatment and get the help. Maybe, maybe we break. Maybe we break it. I hope so. I think it's a long road, though. Long road. Yeah, a very long road and a lot of work for people who are already burnt out. <laughs> yeah, so I, I agree with that. I think that, like, in principle, it's not impossible um, to, to not have trauma associated with um, neurodiversity. But, yeah, the, the aspects of my experience with ADHD sp- symptoms specifically that I think were damaging actually were related to the family dynamics. Yeah. Um, and being blamed and my motives suspected for things that in retrospect I now understand were related to the challenges that I was experiencing. But I don't feel like I was ever given the benefit of the doubt on that. It was always laziness. It was always, yep. you know. Um, so so that, I mean, that is damaging. And I, I do think that there were long-term effects of that. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, given parents that were more informed on this and, and things like that, I don't think that it had to be that way. I have friends who had very different experiences of those things. So, 
There was a, a, a study that I, I think I talked about on Skeptics of the K recently, but I don't recall whether I've just talked about it to people on it. It's hard to tell these days uh, whether I've said it into a microphone there's, before there's or not. There's far too many conversations that we have where Mike goes, I'm, I was going to tell you a story, but I'm going to stop right now because I'll just save it for the show Same and on we'll on the show. Same on air. Thanks for that's much, much better. How, How to ruin a friendship. This discussion. <laughs> but there was a study recently where they took um, uh, groups of people, some of them uh, diagnosed autistic, some of them not, and put them into a situation where they had to learn to effectively communicate with each other. And what they found was that the podcast. autistic people communicate very effectively with other autistic people. Neurotypical people communicate very effectively with other neurotypical people. And the disconnect came where you were talking cross neurotypes. Mm. And I think if, if we had an entire world of autistic people, there wouldn't necessarily be that <laughs> trauma there. Possibly not, but I like I do find I sometimes find it very difficult to interact with autistic and and this is this is this is trauma. This is um, always you know getting into arguments with people because I'm I'm so insistent on things being done the right way um, that I get into these big blow out arguments and and then be told well it's it's your your difficult it's your fault it's your problem mm. you're the reason that that this person's now really, really upset, which means I second guess everything from everybody, which means if I'm talking to autistic people who might be, I've learned to speak the neurotypical language, I've learned to read neurotypical body language, and so I'm talking to an autistic person who presents very differently, who's maybe quite quiet or, or withdrawn in some way, and I'm like, shit, what have I done to upset them? Like, I've, I, I've clearly done something wrong here and then start spiralling into potential miscommunications. That's a result of that trauma. And this is where that trauma comes from, yeah. But it also means I sometimes struggle to communicate even with neurodivergent people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it, it, you know, I'm, I'm second-guessing everything. So I was, I was heavily socially ostracised at school. I had, a, I had a, a, one friend who was also into Doctor Who. That's how we managed to, be, managed <laughs> to maintain a friendship through school, right? Mm -hmm. He actually kind of liked Star Trek more, but, you know, I'll forgive him that. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and, uh, but uh, heavily, heavily socially ostracised all the way through school. And that means I've never really learned how to develop social relationships properly. And so the thing that I've learned to do is start organisations. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that, I'm not joking about that. So by the, by the time I was 18 years old, I was running the Liverpool Doctor Who fan group. Because if I was running it, people had to talk to me. People couldn't avoid talking to me. I've, I've, I had to be involved in the conversation. I've actually discussed this on an autism panel for the university before of this thing of like people think that, you know, we're socially awkward. And it's like, I, pr I come across very well in these situations because the rules are really clear. Like I'm one of the organisers, so it's really easy for me to just chat to people and be friendly and things mm -hmm. because the, rule, the rules are obvious. Yeah. Uh, I stopped running the Doctor Who organisation in my mid-20s. A couple of years later, I started the Merseyside Skeptic Society when I, I put an ad online and said, hey, who's up for this? And Marsh went, me? <laughs> <laughs> Never met each other before, had no idea. Um, uh, but, you know, obviously that, again, I, I was putting myself in the centre of that situation because if I'm, at the, you know, if I'm running the organisation, people can't not talk to me. I have to be involved because I didn't know how to involve myself in other, any other way. But it also means that I put myself to a significant amount of trouble, effort, work. I can't just turn up and enjoy these. I've never been to a QED. <laughs> no idea what it's like. Um, because I, I, put myself in, uh, I, I put myself in a situation where I have to do the work because it's the only way that I know how I can also get that social interaction as well. I've never learned how to do it any other way. Um, and something that's happened, well, I've, the last few years I've taken a step back from Merseyside Skeptic Society. I'm not involved hands-on in, in the organisation anymore. I'm still producing the podcast for them, as I'm sure many of you know. But I'm not really running the organisation anymore. And my social life has collapsed. COVID probably hasn't helped. COVID right? probably hasn't helped. <laughs> but yeah, when I'm talking with a therapist you, you, about you this... You can still come to our events, you know, Mike. You don't have to snub us entirely. But, <laughs> but I feel like I can't. I genuinely yeah. feel like I can't. It's really, it's really tricky. Um, let's, let's move on from that. Um, returning to your point, Lana, about the interaction of neurodiversity and capitalism. Okay. Um, what do you think the challenges are, or, or the benefits indeed, of being neurodivergent in the workplace? Um, sort of depends, right? If, if there's this, there's this myth that if you find the thing you love, you'll never work, which is a great way to ruin How do you feel hobbies. about that, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> um, as someone who plays video games for a living, I can guarantee it's not, it's not a lot of fun. Um, so, uh, but I think 
so obviously we have laws in the UK about accessibility and you can't use a diagnosis like being autistic or being ADHD to discriminate against someone. Um, uh, but I think a lot of, I think there is a lot of stigma around ADHD that means that um, I've certainly had conversations within a company where it's like, oh, this person's autistic. Is that going to, uh, or this person's got ADHD, is that going to be a challenge? But it's, I think usually we would overcompensate because we have trauma from, oh, at that time I was told off too many times in school because I can't remember homework or you feel like you have to over invest in stuff or, or you hyper focus and lose yourself in tasks and then you can't correctly switch between tasks. If you can learn to utilize that or just like my son does at school, that accessibility is not like only for schools. Once you, you go out there and you go into that workplace, that's maybe where we need more work to be done is that accessibility needs to bring itself into the workplace where workplace, workplaces can create environments where um, people can excel there. They can have maybe like, do you know what the worst thing about workplaces now is maybe not so much now we will all work from home. Open plan offices are awful yeah. for neurodivergent people. Like huge rooms with no walls and anyone can come up and interrupt you at any, like it's just the least accessible thing in the world for someone who is neurodivergent. Let's just all go back to tiny cubby holes. <laughs> and, and as you know, Lana, because you and I used to work together for a long time, first thing I did in, in work, noise cancelling headphones on. Thanks very much. I'm going to get on with my job now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's where I think we need to move the, certainly the autism awareness conversation on to is we've, we're now really, really aware about autism. We talk about it a lot. We've, we, I think we've nailed autism awareness. People know it exists. They know, they're starting to know that it is uh, very variable. We're probably a little bit behind on ADHD. We'll probably still need to do a lot more work on, on getting people aware that ADHD is not just the naughty kid in class. Um, but with autism, we're kind of much more, people are much more aware of it. We need to move that into, and now how do we be aware of making our workspaces and our social spaces inclusive for people who are autistic? Because that's a lot of us. Um, and that's where that conversation needs to move because there's so many small things that can be done to structure things differently to make, you know, meetings where you set an agenda that is itemized so that the autistic person knows these are the things we're going to talk about. I can prepare ahead if I if that makes me feel more confident. I know when I can say my bit when my part to contribute comes and I have that structure. Um, it's a really simple thing. It would benefit everybody but it particularly benefits certain types of neurodivergent people. We could, be do, we could do that really easily. Um, yeah. Um, yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, good things. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the idea of like there being niches in which uh, certain forms of neurodiversity can, can really sort of thrive and excel, I think is really interesting. Because like across, like I said, I, I didn't get diagnosed until I had a job and it didn't, it wasn't apparent to me that I was having like significant struggles until I got into an actual job. But I've been doing the same kind of work for years. You know, like the stuff you're doing in grad school is the same stuff that you end up doing in a professor's mm -hmm. position. It's just that it is structured differently such that it's really hard to work with the, the challenges associated with ADHD once you get into... <laughs> Um, an actual job as opposed to what you're doing in grad school. Like usually what my strategy was, uh, was to focus on things in chunks and like work in these like very intense focused bursts on things. And I could get away with that in grad school. Um, it, it was a lot harder to get away with that once I, once I moved into that other kind of environment. But um, so yeah, I don't know. It's the one you hear a lot from people with ADHD, at least where I, I, I live on the internet, right? Um, on Reddit. Uh, the one you hear a lot is um, people with ADHD who excel academically do great in school, do great in high school, and then you get to college where you have to you get to college self university motivate. where you have to self motivate. You nobody's forcing you to go to class. Nobody you at at school you might get set a project and it's due in a week, which is achievable, and you can probably stay up all night like I did on numerous occasions and, and do it just before it's due, right? In university, you're given a project and it's due in three months. 
can't, it's impossible, right? Like it, it might be during, a, if you're doing a PhD, it's during three years or four years or how long, how long is PhD? Depends on the PhD. <laughs> That, that world is somewhere else. Um, uh, it's, it's when you get uh, those structures are in place until they're not there anymore and then it falls apart. And if we recognize what those structures are that we need to succeed in work, then that can carry on. We don't just get to the end and like fall apart. Mm -hmm. So those are the yeah. Sorry, God. I was just going to say I had a slightly different experience than that because I my I didn't hate school by the time I got to college. So it was like all of the stuff that I was doing for classes I was like super excited about or super anxious about. And either way, that was a benefit in terms of like um, sort of I don't know. Yeah, that that thing was there. Yeah, but yeah, uh, no, I had none. The only thing I wanted to do was um, go out and party and then. Uh, catastrophize about my subjects until they were and it's pretty fun. 3 a.m. I, I like next morning. Yeah. Um, I did learn it to stay up all night there. Um, useful for the parenting thing. <laughs> uh, there are some employers, especially in the, in the software and technology space, who um, go out of their way to employ neuro, uh, neurodivergent employees. They go out of their way to actually try and recruit these people. Um, is it ableist to rely on neurodivergent strengths uh, as an employer it's a difficult question isn't it because you know if it we, we should be in a position where um you can recognize your own independent skills and apply them to certain things and and there are ways in which being autistic or neurodivergent are suitable are really good for certain jo jobs for event management and um your ADHD works particularly well for, for running and organizing things and for autistic people who are particularly good at that software stuff um you should be able to use your skills, but you shouldn't be taken advantage of and, and burnt out in doing so. So it depends how you're doing it. Um, that's that assumption thing as well, right? because I'm autistic. Holy shit. That's like, <laughs> no idea. That thing. So if they went out of their way to hire me, I'd just burn. <laughs> but I was, I was um, employed in the, the same job for a long time, like nearly, nearly 20 years I was employed working in the same job. Um, and in hindsight, I think I was, I was heavily abused in that job. Yeah. Um, I wasn't given time off, not because you know, it, it wasn't time off. It was just, oh, Michael, call Mike on his day off. Don't worry, Mike will do it. Mike will take care of it. That's not a problem. Um, uh, still, uh, now I get that that company calls me up and says, Mike, this is broken, this is this. I don't even work here anymore. Why are you, <laughs> why are you calling me up on my day? He's, he's emailed me today and said, you know, this is, this is what's going on. When I changed employer, the first thing I did was worked an obscene amount of overtime mm -hmm. because I didn't want to think that I was letting anybody down. So I was meant to be doing 160 hours a month. I did 200 hours in my first month. Because I didn't want to let anybody down. It was like, I, I know I'm meant to do 160. I'm scared I'm going to do 158 and get into trouble. So I'm going to massively overwork. And in principle, I'm thinking, hey, it's Friday. I only need to do half an hour today. And I've done my hours for the week. But I didn't do half an hour on a Friday. I did 10 hours on the Friday because I got engrossed in doing something. And that was massively beneficial for my employer and dreadful for my mental health. But I don't think in that case, what's happening is that the hiring of the autistic person is the ablest thing, is the fact that you have, you don't have accessibility at the center of your employment practices and that you're not considering accessibility needs of your employees to make sure, you know, if you do know that you have autistic members of staff who will be prone to overworking, you need a system in place that help support them to not overwork to remind them that they have to go home at five o'clock and, and and switch off for the for the day and, and not check their emails and that's when your employer has a responsibility to know mike will check his emails at four o'clock in the morning so i'm not going to email mike at four o'clock in the morning i might email this other person at four o'clock in the morning because i know they're going to switch their computer off and they won't see it till they're back in work but mike will check it out of work so I modify my behavior to support his needs. I work for a firm where they're trying to introduce more neurodiversity, but to manage it, they get to into a load of neurotypical project managers over the top. Mm -hmm. And there's this sort of, you know, sort of, and these people aren't really suitable for management and managing teams anyway. So the whole thing just turns into a, a, a moment of diagnosis. <laughs> 
That sounds like every software company trying to implement Agile for the first time ever. <laughs> As a former ADHD project manager, um, we're much better at it. <laughs> so it's, it's probably easier today to obtain a formal diagnosis uh, than it has ever been before in the past. Um, but nevertheless, a diagnosis still remains out of reach for many, many people. Uh, what do we think the solutions are for individuals who've not obtained a formal diagnosis and is self-ID valid? Anyone, go for it. Well, I have lots of opinions on this. I think self-diagnosis is fundamentally crucial for any any health condition that affects your long-term life. You you know, especially if you're neurodivergent, we research the fuck out of things. If you've read all the stuff and you think this, you know your own body, you know your own brain, if you think this fits for you, then then it fits for you. You're autistic. Like, yeah, we can't police those diagnoses. And I think certainly a lot of autistic people I've met particularly um, are reluctant to self-ID, will be very aware that, you know, I don't want to will be very sensitive to not co-opting terminology that they don't think belongs to them. They don't want to um, kind of put themselves in a space that no no professionals told them that they belong in. They don't want to take advantage of other autistic people who they know are struggling. Um, and I mean, we've, we've all got very black and white brains. You, we, we are prone to wanting, well, the specialist has told me and therefore I'm allowed to call myself autistic. Um, it's very much the position I was in. Very, very much the position I was in. And I suspected I was autistic for at least 10 years, but didn't use the label, didn't use the terminology until um, the, the gatekeeper opened the gate for me and said, here you go. <laughs> and it can't work because there's so many people who ca just can't access diagnosis. I, I went through NHS for a diagnosis because I couldn't, I maybe could have afforded to, to get a private diagnosis, but I couldn't, didn't feel like I could justify the spend. So I waited for three years to get access to a diagnosis. I know people who go much longer, obviously in other countries where it's you have to pay to get that access to those specialists. That is prohibitive for people who are mar marginalized in poverty. Lots of different reasons why people can't access diagnosis. We have to be better at accepting self-diagnosis. Um, you know your own brain. You is self-ID a, a sticking plaster over a lack of access to formal diagnosis? No. Good question. Maybe. I don't know. I can't imagine a world in which our healthcare systems work well enough that people get the, universally get the support that they need. So I think it's something that will always have to exist. Because we know there are people who cosplay disability for clout. There's, there's been people who, you know, pretended they had cancer to get the social media views and, and things that it there happens. Are, but it there probably isn't happening yeah, enough. There are very, very few people who do that. Yes, there are people who do it. And then the big example is Belle Gibson, who who claimed she had um, cancer and didn't. Um, is it Belle Gibson? Or I think it was, on? yes. Um, <laughs> um, Wouldn't be the worst thing Mel Gibson's done. Yeah. <laughs> Like, uh, so I'm I'm a person with other disabilities. Um, I'm no, I'm not getting good things for being disabled. I'm almost exclusively getting bad things for being disabled. Um, I don't. You don't get more views. You don't get more likes. You don't get more um, interactions. That you're not making money from being disabled. Faking disability of any sort just it isn't that common. Of course, it happens a little bit, and, and there's the big name examples that we can come to, but. It mostly doesn't happen. And why would you want to? Because you are marginalised if you are disabled. Can I just say that I used to see quite a lot of people in the UK to me saying, I'm bipolar or I'm this or I'm autistic. Or, and they weren't. And they were usually kids who had other problems. Yes. And they were... And they, and they were wrong. They didn't. They, they, they didn't have what they said they had. But they wouldn't be saying that they had it unless they already had other problems. And that's absolutely a thing that we see... Yes, so um, um, Cleo just pointed out that many people that she sees, because she works in this sort of field, um, who would come saying that they thought they had a diagnosis like bipolar or, or autism would uh, perhaps be wrong, but they had some other health issue that, that had gone undiagnosed. And I think that is the main issue with self-diagnosis is that, and this is something we see in the kind of, woo space is quite a lot of people who think that they've got chronic Lyme disease which doesn't really exist 
but they've definitely got something wrong. They've definitely got symptoms of something and they're just looking for the label that fits. Um, and there are people who will take advantage of that and, in, and tell them that chronic Lyme disease is a thing. Um, and that's a problem as well. Um, Lana and Lindsay, with respect to ADHD, uh, is there less value in self uh, ID in, in that area where a self ID diagnosis is not going to get you access to the treatment that you need in the way that a formal diagnosis is able to? Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> true. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I really appreciate the point about mistake, like self misdiagnosis. I think that's really important to keep in mind. But I think that like the value in self ID sort of in and of itself or like moving more toward accepting when somebody says I am struggling with these things, that they are struggling with those things, even if they've got the label wrong or they've got some of the stuff wrong, um, is just that like the the constant suspicion over like, well, are you actually having these struggles in this particular space or are you really just lazy? Like, <laughs> that's the reason my impulse was, was very much toward when I saw this question, very much toward saying, yes, we should be more accepting of self-ID. But you're right. Um, I do think that like ultimately probably an equally important problem is it increasing accessibility to actual diagnosis because as you say you're not going to hand the amphetamines not, out to anyone that's right? correct <laughs> that's correct and those are kind of important as it turns out yeah um yeah 100 percent. it's if if self-id gets you access to the the um accommodations that you need great when i so when i was diagnosed with adhd they explained what the treatment options are. And it's like, okay, you can just take this away and do whatever with it, do your own information. You can have talking therapy, you can have medication, or you can have what we recommend, which is a, a mixture of talking therapy and medication. I went, okay, great. I'm going to take all that information out, away. I'm going to fail to act on it for a year because I have ADHD. And it's a, a battery of tests and uh, blood tests and then I've got to chase those up and then get them back to the doctor and so it's the it's always system is not set up for ADHD brains at it's, all it's it's a catch-22 if you can get the if you can get to the end of that you don't have ADHD um, <laughs> but uh I I I what persuaded me in the end was I looked at the data and the data for ADHD is like no treatment is this talking is this it's like a millimeter above Meds is just up here and talking and meds is a millimeter above that. The great talking therapy. And the talking lot, therapy probably just helps with the trauma that you've, <laughs> that you've got from, from growing up ADHD. Um, so the, the societal idea around ADHD and drug seeking behavior is a huge problem, especially where we have these myths of mothers trying to get their kids diagnosed with ADHD so they can have the amphetamines to lose weight or cope with their horrendous lives imposed by patriarchy or whatever um <laughs> but uh, uh the as i started my first titration of medication was that two weeks ago and my dishes are done <laughs> and my house is hoovered i know right and there is food in my fridge <laughs> and this sounds like basic not off. stuff <laughs> so <right. laughs> maybe some of it um, <laughs> it sounds like basic stuff everyone, everyone else is like every, when i tell anyone about my mess they're like oh that's the good stuff well oh, maybe i can try it and i'm like it, it ah, gets me to basic life <laughs> i can do the dishes <laughs> everyone's like oh don't abuse those and i'm like I just want to wash clothes, <laughs> get out of bed. And open the mail. It's so scary. <laughs> it's so scary, the mail. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I think that access to diagnosis, especially when it comes to age HD, yeah. absolutely has to happen. Self-ID is great, especially if self-ID pushes you to get that diagnosis. But it, fundamentally, the best treatment we have at the moment for ADHD is medication. Um, and unless you've you've got access to that, you're kind of starting that that race so far back it's, it's and especially impossible. as you say like in this capitalist world where <laughs> it's all about making money and working hard and you've got to prove that you're working so hard adhd has got to be one of the more stigmatized things because it, it's the worst thing in the world you could possibly be is lazy and you often labeled as lazy for not getting managing to get stuff done that gets you pet gets your employer paid so we're running short on time. Uh, we're not going to take questions. I don't like talking to people. Um, <laughs> so 
Uh, I just want to very, very... Talk at people, not to people. <laughs> Got a fear of private speaking. So I'm just going to move down the line. Um, if there was one thing um, that you could tell the neurotypical members of our audience um, about how to better relate to and understand their neurodiverse friends, what would it be? I'll start with you, Lindsay. Uh, ask questions about it. I think. Of, of your friends. Of your friends. Not of Google. Is that good? Okay, cool. Lana? Um... Assume the best. It's better. I want that one. So, <laughs> I have ADHD. Mike has autism. My son has autism. It's a very complicated household. Um, before you get to anything else. <laughs> my cat is also a jerk. Um, but Cat's got ADHD. <laughs> Wait. So, Mike and I used to argue a lot before we both got diagnosed. And everyone, like so many of those arguments was, Mike's autism has presented in a way that's made me feel in a way that it's offensive. Like Mike is shut down and then I feel like I'm getting the silent treatment and then I'm badgering him and then he feels attacked and then that becomes the thing. But if you just stop back and assume the best in any given situation with someone who is neurodivergent and go okay I know this person loves me what is it that's happening here and how can I help them then everything's so much better like 100% yeah I think I have to agree I think that would that, that would be the biggest thing the thing that I comment against clashes more than anything with other people is people and this I mean this is a good rule for life don't assume people's intentions because we most of our arguments come from oh well this person's doing this and they're clearly being that and it's like no maybe they just didn't think about it or they didn't realize or they're dealing with their own thing and they've 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 not reached out to you when you're struggling with x because they're struggling with y and they just haven't told you about it um assuming good intentions i think is should be rule one for for everybody but it is especially useful for autistic and uh, adhd people who do get misinterpreted a lot to start from that basic, we're all human, we all mean well, no one's trying to upset each other um, on purpose. There's very few people who deliberately want to upset people. Um, it's a good starting point. Yeah, please uh, be patient with us. We're trying our best. Um, uh, and listen to us when we tell you what, what we need and what we don't need. Um, that's, that's a really helpful and beneficial thing for us. Um, I think we're going to leave it there. Um, QED runs on time, right? So <laughs> we're going to draw a line under it there. Thank you very, very much for coming, everybody. And thank you to my panel, um, Alice Howarth, Lana Donaghy and Lindsay Osmond. <laughs>